Before I begin the sermon, I'd also like to very most sincerely thank Bishop Agua for coming to do the ordinations. I know it was very last minute, and uh, we certainly appreciate the sacrifice that we made. Our week of the release is a national holiday. It's a holy day in Mexico, and what a big sacrifice it was for him to be away from his people and to give us the honor of doing these ordinations. I'd like to also thank all of our priests for coming. I know that many of them have other responsibilities. It is a sacrifice to come. Especially Father Krzysztof, he said this trip from Moscow, Russia, was only 23 hours long. So, very appreciative for him coming all this way. We'd also like to thank Reverend Mother Mary Agnes from Spokane, and the sisters came with her, and thank all of the Catholic faithful here. Before I get into the sermon, just wanted to share one thing with you. As you know, back in May, we asked all of you to pray for Teresa Sanquist, the mother of Father Stephen Sanquist, that she could be here for the ordination of her son. That was not God's will. Interestingly, during our Fatima conference, we had a pontifical mass, and during the sermon, the pontifical mass, they spoke about Teresa. And what a wonderful example of, of Catholic womanhood. Humble, charitable, generous, self-sacrificing, sweet, amiable. I can't say enough about her. And I also mentioned in the sermon about the tribute that her sons had given to her uh, at the reception, after the funeral. And I mentioned about how, I remember in the morning, we are getting ready for school, and everything just here, going here and there and everywhere. And Stephen came in, Father Sanquist came into my office, he asked to talk to me, I said, sure, and he said, my mother, she didn't open up her eyes. And that was the last time he had been able to give a communion. And I said, Stephen, she be grateful for the days that she had to give her everyday communion for about a month, month and a half. Now I gave that little story it was part of my sermon at Mount St. Michael's here at the conference, and a woman came up to me after the conference, uh, after the pontifical mass I'm having breakfast before my conference, and she said, Bishop, you have to warn me ahead of time to give those types of stories, As she said, I, I just didn't help but break down. I'd like to tell you who that woman was. That was Lynn Schindler. Lynn Schindler on Tuesday night, died of a massive heart attack. And can't say enough about the woman. Very good Catholic example. Uh, raised many, many children. Was very, very strong in faith. When we talk to the students about different issues in so far as theology, especially when it comes to our Lord, we talk about the Holy Land, and I'll never forget when we visited the Cape of Bethlehem, Lynn Schindler was getting this blessing of respected mothers in the Cape of Bethlehem by Father Dennis Chacoin. Never forget, she was just profuse of crying, she was so happy. And the baby she was carrying happened to be Patrick, her son that got killed in a car accident when he was 17. So, wonderful things that we think about, reflect on during this ordination. We look back at many of the sacrifices and difficulties the parents have made to raise your children, and especially to have three priests of God, other Christ, to ascend the altar and to offer the holy sacrifice of the Mass to Him. Raise their hand and have the power to forgive sin. That's an awesome thing. I'd like to congratulate our newly ordained priests and their families and relatives. I'd like to congratulate our new sub deacons and the seminarians who advanced to the minor orders. It's a very, very special occasion. These are memories that you keep forever. It has become a tradition for us to have ordinations December 12th, the Feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe. One of the beautiful things about Our Lady of Guadalupe is this. She came as a loving mother. Her words to Juan Diego are most affectionate. Am I not here, your loving mother? 
I am not in the folds of my mantle. Is there anything I can do for you? When we think of our Lady Guadalupe, we think of the living miracle that can be seen today. Our Lady, when she appeared to Juan Diego, told Juan Diego, this humble Aztec Indian convert, go to the bishop of Mexico City, Bishop Zumaraga, tell him that the Mother of God wishes a, a church to be built in her honor here in this desolate place. Juan Diego <coughs> told Our Lady, my lady sends someone else. I'm not worthy. The bishop's not going to believe me. No one day will I want you. <coughs> the bishop listened to Juan Diego with interest, but his reply was, I cannot do this unless I have a sign. So Juan Diego left, not sure what he should do or what was his next step. He returns home, and sure enough, his uncle, Juan Bernardino, was dying. So very, very early in the morning, he set out to Mexico City to get a priest to give his, about his uncle the last rites. In a simple, humble way, he thought, I'm not going to go down this path, because that's where our lady appeared. I'm going to go down another path. And as you're going down this other path, our lady appears to him. Juan Diego was a little bit embarrassed, like, my lady, what are you doing up so early, or something like that? And our blessed mother said to Juan Diego, Juan, my dear son, don't worry about your uncle. He will live. Go up the hill, and there you will see the sign to give to the bishop. Juan Diego goes up the hill of Tepeyac. Now, this is a desolate, barren place. No wonder what do you find there with roses growing on this desolate hill. Yeah, is the rose that comes to his toma. It's this cactus type fiber, or poncho. And he goes quickly to see the bishop. He announces to the bishop, I have the sign. And as he opens up his toma, not only do the roses fall out, but the image of Our Lady appears right on the toma. And the bishop and all the women fell on their knees. What are the miraculous principles or properties of this stone? Well, first of all, the material is made out of it normally deteriorates after 10, 15, 20 years for sure. The tilma is over 487 years old and still intact. Another very interesting thing is with regard to <clears throat> The roses were supposed to be the sign, at least one day thought that. And the bishop could see for himself. There's no way that we could have roses at this time of the year. But the more you study the tilma, you see some features that maybe at first sight wouldn't strike. There are paintings that were made around the time of 1531 that are now faded and drawn that are basically of no, of no, no consequence. But the picture and the image of Our Lady is brilliant. The colors are brilliant. There have been experts who have examined the images. This is just amazing how you can get such clarity of an image on such a rough, a rough uh, foundation as this, this practice fight. We also know, too, that during the time of the Catholic persecution in Mexico, Someone placed a bomb right on the altar in the flowers. The explosion completely disfigured the iron crucifix, blew out the windows, destroyed the communion rail. The image of Our Lady was left completely intact. There are many, many other interesting things that we could say, especially with regard to Our Lady's eyes. There was an ophthalmologist named Dr. Brau, and he was a renowned ophthalmologist, very well known internationally. And he approached the examination of eyes very skeptical. But the amazing thing is this when he took his ophthalmologist scope and looked into the eyes, 
to his great amazement, the eyes had that like a real human eye. It actually had luminosity. You could see right into the eye. He said at one point, he was so taken up by what he saw, the eyes of the image on the pillow, he forgot himself and said, would you please look uh, a little bit higher up? He realized, I'm looking at an image. This is something miraculous. There are many other things that we can tell you, but the point is, is this. When we think of our Blessed Mother appearing, she had a message, not just for Juan Diego, not just for the most beautiful basilica there, but a message for all of us that she is our loving mother. But one other point I should tell you before I forget. On Our Lady's mantle that she's wearing, there are stars. You might think, yeah, randomly those are the stars that to decorate her mantle. But on closer observation, those stars form, form the constellation of the sky, December 12th, what the sky will look at that night when you see the stars on the mantle. <coughs> Significant things. And when Our Lady appeared, what a wonderful incentive it was for the Mexican people, the Aztecs, Indians, especially to convert to the Catholic faith. How does this relate to ordination? All of us are children of Mary. Our Blessed Mother is our spiritual mother, but especially a priest. Our Blessed Mother is the mother of the eternal high priest, Jesus Christ. And how important it is for our priests to look to Mary, the mother of God, as their own spiritual mother. As a priest, we have to remind ourselves we are Christ's representatives. Our Lord wished our, his work, his mission of saving souls to continue to the end of time. And that's why he instituted the Holy Priesthood. The priest, as we've already said, is the other, is another Christ. But let us never forget, if our work is to bear fruit, then how important it is that we realize we're just instruments. It's God's grace that converts hearts. It's God's grace that lifts up the sinner. It's God's grace that sanctifies the soul. Our Blessed Mother, being the Mother of God, is our powerful intercessor. We need to pray for the perseverance of all of our priests. Satan knows the good that even one priest can do, and thus he will do all that he can to try to attack our priests, to try to lead them astray, and he can do it very, very subtly. And that's the reason why we ask our Blessed Mother always to look over our seminarians and our priests, to watch over and protect them. We know that Satan would like nothing more to destroy vocation. And our, for our newly ordained priest, congratulations. Stay close to our Blessed Mother. And remember, especially when you offer the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, who is there as Jesus sacrificed himself on the cross? Now who stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother. When you ascend the steps to offer the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, Ask Mary, our spiritual mother, mother of God, our mother, to stand by you, that you might worthily offer this holy sacrifice. I'd like to say just one brief thing about vocations. I know it's warm in here, so I won't long, and the parents of the little children have done a great job. But regarding vocations, let us remember this. Our Lord's words, the harvest is indeed great, but the laborers are few. I see this because I travel everywhere. So many opportunities to start something here, get something going there. There's only so much time. There's only so many priests, and there's almost you know, only so many opportunities. There are many things that young men can do in life: a doctor, a nurse, carpenter, plumber, electrician, you name it. But there's nothing greater than being a priest. St. Dionysius says, of all the works that man can do, the greatest is that of saving souls. The salvation of souls. That's why Christ came down from heaven and shed his precious blood to redeem us. 
And after the priesthood, we think of the religious like brothers and sisters to assist the priest in their work for souls. The priest can't do everything, they can't be everywhere, and the priests are assisted by brothers and sisters to pull up the slack and do those things that they can't get to or they can't uh, take care of. We do need vocations. And one last thing. Well, one last thing is this. When it comes to a vocation, it is a choice. Our Lord said, if thou wilt be perfect, come follow her. I want to do God's will, whatever God's will is. Let us remember it is a choice, it is a sacrifice. And as our Lord has promised, you get a hundredfold of this life and life to come eternal life. But let us never think that, oh no, not me, I'm not meant to be a priest, or I'm not meant to be a religious. For boys, it makes well like girls. Congratulations, we both are good, it's small. And for girls, I like boys. Congratulations again, that's small. But you give up something good, perhaps a married life, for something better. A life consecrated to God. And that's why Christ promises such a tremendous reward in this life and in eternity. So when it comes to vocation, young people, young men and young women, your attitude should be, Lord, what would I have to do? What is God's will? And be ready to do it, make that sacrifice. You need that generosity of heart. You don't have to. No one's going to force you. But our Lord, who calls you, don't reject the call. Pray to know God's will. And pray for the generosity to make that sacrifice, to leave all behind, like his apostles and disciples here. Like we have so much of a wonderful example the last 2,000 years of people leaving mother, father, sister, brother, lands, everything for God. That's a big sacrifice. So we pray for more vocations. We do need vocations. We have this one. We have 13 seminarians here. And we pray for more vocations in the future. So to our new year day priests, congratulations. To our deacons and those in my orders, congratulations. To all of you faithful. Thank you for coming here and being a support and showing your, your assistance by prayers and sacrifices that people are sending their going. We really appreciate that. And may God bless all of you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.